Well, I was accepted to the Rhode Island School of Design, which ended up being my final choice. I was also accepted to Art Center, which is in Los Angeles, and also the Otis Center of Design. I think that's what it's called. I don't quite remember. And also the School of Arts Institute of Chicago, SAIC. Um, I was, I think I was accepted to several more, but I don't remember their names because ultimately the school that was the most important to me was RISD, and that's where I ended up going. Mm -hmm. And what was the process like for you getting your portfolio together in a nutshell? Did you like it? Was it super stressful? How would you capture that? Hmm. Well, of course it was super stressful because I also had to balance high school life at the same time and high school life is tough. <laughs> but I tried to view the whole process also as like a learning process because the more work I did, the more I improved. And then the more I realized where my portfolio could go in terms of like what direction. So as you can probably see later in my portfolio, I did focus a lot on portraiture and that was like a really nice discovery for me to find in the whole portfolio process. We are going to eventually go through each one of Kat's pieces so you can talk to us about the individual artworks. But right now what I'm doing is just scrolling through all the images so you guys can really see the breadth of work that's in Kat's portfolio. Because what I get asked a lot by students is what is more important, technique or concept? Should I be super diverse or not? And I think the diversity is so critical in an art school portfolio. Diversity in terms of subject matter, also in terms of materials. So Kat, how did you get started with this? Like, were you working totally by yourself? Were you taking an art class at your high school? Like, what was your um, resources in terms of putting together your portfolio? Well, my high school did have an art program, so I did take art classes. In the end, I was taking AP art, which was advanced placement art. And I did have a lot of classmates around me with whom I could talk to and share work with. But in terms of seriously applying to art school, I was the only one who was serious about going to art school. So I had some friends who were applying just like for fun, I guess, on a whim. Um, but they were mostly applying to like STEM schools, which were their first choices. But for me, art was like my first choice. So I don't know, I think in that case, it was a little bit lonesome. And I didn't really know who to turn to in terms of how they were feeling about the whole process, because I was the only one who was serious. And ultimately, that was lonesome. But fortunately, I had also taken an art summer camp sort of situation program in CalArts and I met a lot of other people through that program so I could actually talk with them online and not feel so lonesome throughout the process. And by the way those of you who are watching right now feel free to jump into the chat hello 10,000 crows and ask Kat your questions ask me what my experience was like because I think <laughs> one pattern that I notice whenever I speak to high school students is that almost everybody I know is totally on their own. Every now and then I'll meet some student who's maybe going to a very prestigious private school that has an incredible art department and they have a lot of support, but that's very, very few people. And I don't know about you, Kat, but I found that really hard to deal with. Just feeling like I didn't have anybody who could commiserate with a lot of the challenges yeah. because everybody else was thinking about oh, well, what about my college essay? And I got to do really well on the chemistry exam. And I'm there going, right. uh, yeah, guys, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and I really was the only person at my high school, just like you, who applied. Uh -huh. Nobody else did. Everybody else was like, I need to go to Yale and Harvard. And I really had a hard time with that, especially because in the olden days, we had no internet. And so uh -huh. I had no opportunity to number one, connect with other students, but also I had no clue what portfolios look like because you know now we have these videos and there's a whole lot on YouTube where you can actually see people's portfolios, but I was, it was a total shot in the dark for me. So you guys should be grateful you've got the internet now to help you. Although I do sometimes think seeing the portfolios can be very toxic in a way. Do you want yeah, to talk about sure. that, Kat? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, here we are doing um, it to you. We're showing you Kat's portfolio, but I think it's a little different when we do it 
as opposed to those accepted art school portfolio critiques, not critiques, videos that you see. We're a little bit different because I'm a professor and Kat is not in school right now and it's not super recent. But anyway, Kat, talk to us about just that experience of seeing so many other people's portfolios and how that affects you. Uh, I eventually actually had to cut out the number of portfolios I was looking at on YouTube and the internet, et cetera, because it was really disheartening because I thought I would never draw like so-and-so or I would never paint like so-and-so. And I think the whole point about creating a portfolio for yourself is to make your own work and discovering that whole process yourself. Um, but that being said, it is, it is helpful to look up a little bit, do some research, <laughs> but also know when it is correct to also like cut yourself away from that and give yourself some space. I think it also, another thing I was going through was people I knew in real life were drawing better than me too. <laughs> like the people I met in the summer program that I went to in CalArts, um, they drew so well that it felt really disheartening for me to be in the program in the first place, but luckily everyone was extremely kind. And, you know, they also like verbally supported me <laughs> and, um, you know, complimented me and said stuff like other things I could improve on as well. But sometimes you need to take some time for yourself as well. For sure. We've got a comment from OAM in the chat. Hi, I just found this channel today. Oh, that's very cool. Can you tell us how you found us? Because I'm always just really curious how people stumble across our channel. And, and that's a question for everybody. So if you guys want to jump into the chat, tell us how you found us. Because I know a lot of people do find us through YouTube, but sometimes it's because somebody told you. And I'm just always curious because I think it's really cool how people find each other. All right, so Kat, let's go through your pieces individually and maybe you can just talk about the experience of making them and obviously i'm here to assist with that as well so let's start with this first piece i believe this is an oil painting how did you get the idea for creating this piece uh, so i took ap art in high school right advanced placement art and one of the ap requirements is actually to create a whole portfolio a whole body of work with one theme and the theme i chose was portraiture um, because I was just interested in people and I thought, well, I could render living people well, so I might as well just milk that while I can. <laughs> so I asked my friend to come sit in my garage um, and I played a movie for her and then I just painted her. And after she left, that's when I added everything like the background, finished up her face, her clothing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think one thing that I regretted about this painting was her look because it's very clear that she's very dazed <laughs> because she's looking watching <laughs> all the movies I was playing for her <laughs> but other than that I was quite happy with the result but it is also something to note that this is a painting I did later on in my last year of high school so I've had a lot of practice a lot of other paintings that I haven't shown yet until I reach this final result and Kat where did you learn oil painting because oil painting is so specialized and you really do need a lot of very specific information in order to do it successfully. So how did you go about acquiring those skills? Did you do an online course or what did you do? Yeah, uh, luckily for me, my mother is an art teacher. That's <laughs> so handy. When I, yeah, that's extremely handy. <laughs> um, and in my childhood, she forced me to draw a lot and also paint a lot. So one of my uh, first, my first memory of oil painting was her forcing me to do a Rembrandt um, study. So it was just like this old portrait of Rembrandt and I had to copy it. And that was when I really saw how to layer oil paints and see that color wasn't just the obvious color. Like when you see a flesh tone, it's not usually just one color. It's usually also reds and blues and greens and things you don't usually see. So I had a, my mother help me out with that a lot. <laughs> That's a great exercise, um, you guys. If you really want to learn how to paint, do a master copy. Now, to be clear, that's not something to put in your portfolio. That's right. something you do as an exercise so you learn the brushwork better. Because I did a John Singer Sargent copy when I was in art school, and I learned so much about brushwork. But don't put it in your portfolio. We've got a question mm -hmm. from 10,000 Crows in the chat. Sometimes I make art and I post it on Instagram and I don't get much recognition for it and it crushes my soul. Do you have any advice <laughs> about that type of thing? Also, I found you guys while looking up videos on learning how to oil paint. Oh, cool. I'm glad oh, to hear well, that well, that well, video came across since yours truly, <laughs> Hark. 
in that video. We had so much fun with that video. That was really funny. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> so Kat, what's your take on that? Posting on social media and evaluating that response or not? What do you do with that? Because I don't know Gosh. any artist who has not had that thought at some point about Instagram, including myself. Right. Oh, I think it's really important to note that social media sites like that is not a dictator of how good you are as an artist. A lot of those um, social media apps, they use like algorithms or whatever fancy scientific logistical thing that they use. And they just connect people with easy to like things. And that doesn't necessarily connect you with the things that are the most thoughtful or the ones that you appreciate, you would appreciate the most. And I think that goes to say, it's the same thing when you're on the internet in general, like there are cookies or whatever you call those things. They just connect you to whatever you search last. And if you like search one panda, you're just going to get a hundred pandas after that. It's not very <laughs> so, good in terms of creative right. stimulation. In fact, it does the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just say, don't take it too much to heart. <laughs> I know it might feel frustrating when the work that you spend like hundreds of hours on isn't getting the recognition that it deserves, but just know in time, once you build up a body of work, all that stuff will be quite trivial and won't matter because what will matter are the quality of people who will see your quality work naturally. It will naturally come. You will have, you have your audience. You'll have the recognition. You know, I would do 10,000 crows. I would maybe stop posting while you're working on your portfolio because I think it's just mm -hmm. enough pressure just to make the portfolio and then doing it on Instagram almost makes it worse. And I can tell right. you guys from my experience, the stuff that I post on Instagram that gets high engagement, it's usually some crummy sketch that I threw together in like 10 minutes. And I'll post yeah. some artwork that I've been really working hard on for a year and slaving over and it gets no engagement. And I know right. from working professionally that if I tried to show at an exhibition that crummy little sketch, nobody would take me seriously. It's a crummy little sketch. Mm -hmm. So in the professional <laughs> world, that doesn't have a lot of weight. But on Instagram, it does because it's easy. It's mm -hmm. a quick read. It's something people can understand without thinking hard at all. So if you have right. an artwork that really does invite deeper contemplation, that's not going to do well on Instagram. And that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I, I would feel really <laughs> crappy about that. So... I would just say either stop posting or maybe just like share it with your family and friends. Like if you have like a WhatsApp account or something and you have like a group, just show it to a few friends. And that's, that's enough because yeah. the yeah. Instagram thing can be so toxic. And I say to mm -hmm. people all the time, I'm so happy there was no Instagram when I was in high school because I think I would have <laughs> just been crushed. I mean, I already was crushed. It would have been like being crushed to the 10th <laughs> hour, which I did not need. <laughs> All right, we have another comment from Ashley J. How critical is it the number of figure drawings that are recommended in a portfolio? We don't have access to nude models. Is it better to draw clothed figures from life? Okay, well, Kat actually has a mm. bunch of gesture drawings. So let me pull up a bunch of those. And Kat, maybe you can jump into that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, so I mean, the number of figure drawings you put, I mean, it shouldn't be your whole portfolio. <laughs> you should have some finished works as well. Um, I guess like a good ratio to look at is maybe 20% of your portfolio to be figure drawings, but that's not a black and white answer. It could be as many or as few as you want, as long as they're there and they can show that you know the figure and you can draw. But that's a little tricky also because you don't want to show too little because figure drawings, there's many ways to do it. Like there are two minute gesture drawings or there can be an hour long rendered image as well. Well, so Kat, is this and done think, in Vine Charcoal from a nude model in a class, this image? Yeah, that was in Vine Charcoal and that was for the summer program I was in. And by the way, those summer programs in those schools are very helpful. Um, Sometimes they cost quite a bit of money, oh, but I'm sure they're expensive. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, there's a financial aid sometimes, but it also depends on the school because the one I went to is not as expensive as the other ones I have researched. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, the one that's shown right now is Vine Charcoal, and that was also my first time doing blind contour drawing, which means I was looking at the model and I was just drawing and I wasn't looking at my drawing. And it turned out to be a really cool gestural movement drawing. So now, Kat, really what expensive. about these other figure drawings that you have? So this one is actually a figure that is not 
totally nude. How did you get a reference for this? Um, oh, okay. Sorry. I can see oh, it that's on okay. the screen. Yeah, yeah. So that one was also in the arts program I was in. She's She was just a model that was there. Again, take those summer classes. But I will also add, after my summer program, I realized how important figure drawings were. So I took the time to research a figure drawing session. I dragged my friend over and I booked it there. <laughs> and Honestly, okay, when you're below the age of, I think, 18, you're not allowed to be in a figure drawing session where someone is nude. They have to be clothed. So those are the only models I encountered during my time in the art program. But during that art session that I went with my friend, they didn't know we were underage. So the guy just stripped and we were like, okay, we'll just draw. I mean, it didn't phase us at all. <laughs> and ultimately it was like really helpful for our portfolios. But even clothed models help. And schools will understand. Schools will understand you're underage and you're not allowed to be in those sort of sessions. So just go for it. Just find a session somewhere or go to an art school or you can just draw people off on the street. I mean, a lot of my portfolio is actually drawings of my teachers, <laughs> my high school teachers. And we'll see them as we go through this portfolio. But really, any figure drawing helps at all. I mean, you guys, really, the best time to draw people when they're playing video games. They don't move. I mean, they're, they're just like this <laughs> for like hours and hours on end. And if they move, it's minimal. Or actually, when yeah. people are on their phones, they don't move much either. And I did but I have... I argue that those are really boring poses. <laughs> they are, but the thing is, you can move around them. So you can sit on the floor and look at them. You can get up and walk to the other side. I mean, I did this really yeah. funny drawing of my nephew. He had headphones on, a blanket over his body, and he was wearing <laughs> boxer shorts and playing at a laptop. It was just such a weird drawing. <laughs> but here's the other thing, you guys, you don't have to draw humans to draw gestures. You can draw yeah. your cats. If you guys have yes. a cat, if you have a dog, if you've got a friend that has that, I draw my guinea pigs all the time. And to me, mm -hmm. this is the exact same principle of just drawing. It's just that the figure that you're drawing is a little bit different, but it all counts <laughs> because what I hear a lot from students, they say, oh, well, I don't have access to nude models. I'm going to go online and draw from those figure drawing websites that have those photos. And to me, that's such a bad idea because you're just learning all kinds of bad habits because when you're drawing from a static photograph, it's too easy. And I think that mm -hmm. when you work from life, Try looking at this tutorial that me and Lauren did. Her cats did not sit still, okay? They were like <laughs> up and moving around, but it was fun and it kept me on my toes. And I really enjoyed that challenge a lot. Okay, let's move on and take a look at this piece here, which is this yellow woman with like an orange shadow. <laughs> Tell us about this piece. Yeah, that's a high school teacher. Um... <laughs> did you like her? What do you think from seeing this drawing? It's really sad. Like, oh man. Oh <laughs> yeah. So this was like my first day of this math class, and it was just like freshly. I was freshly out of that art program, so I was like, draw, 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 draw. I was like still in that math mindset. So the first day of math class, I was drawing this teacher. And I was told later that the whole time she was just like eyeing me and giving me like the dirty look out of the corner of her eye. But since it was the first day, she didn't do anything, luckily. But after that day, I could not draw at all in her class. And I was, well, you know, it makes sense. If you're in math class, you should study math. <laughs> but I was like really happy I got this drawing of her because it, it looks like her. <laughs> well, but see, here's the thing, guys. If you go online and you Google a picture of a person, okay? You say, okay, here's some random picture of some person and I can draw it, fine. You can do a physical mm -hmm. description of that person. But the thing is, this is not just a physical description. This person really has personality. Like I don't know this teacher in real life, but I feel looking at the drawing that I know what a sad life they live. And little <laughs> things like the shirt, that pattern, that's so specific. And that, again, is a piece of someone's personality that you wouldn't get from some generic stock photo that you find online. And I've been encouraging a lot of my high school students to sketch their friends and teachers in class 
the drawings are so funny. Like I had this one girl, <laughs> she drew this teacher who was a sub and he looked really stressed. Like it was the funniest <laughs> drawing I've ever seen. And I just love seeing them when they draw their friends because people have such mm-hmm. specific hairdos and all the accessories. And it's like, you look at those stock photos and everybody looks exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's take a look at maybe this next piece. You've got these two drawings that are like of a fireplace that are all in line with some gray tones. I guess there's two of them. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one of a classroom, actually. So let's talk yeah. about the one with the fireplace first. And by the way, those of you in the chat, I know you've got questions for us. We will get to you. Let's look at this one, then we'll take some questions. Right. Uh, the scenario of this one was it was a Christmas party. You can probably tell from the stockings and the Christmas tree. And uh, this was just like the home in my like father's employer's house. So clearly this guy had money and had a great house. So I just like drew part of the interior. And the reason why I drew it specifically was, first of all, I was bored and I was there and I had a sketchbook. Second of all, I knew that my portfolio was lacking subjects that weren't people because I kept drawing people so in this case I was like okay let's just draw an interior let's just go do it and I think the challenge for this one was I tried to draw everything in one line which is why even the shadows have the line the black line oh wait you all didn't like line. lift your pen right I didn't I didn't it's just one pen. continuous line yeah yeah so <laughs> wasn't that a little stressful um well no because it was sort of a sketchbook piece that I didn't really care that much about I was just like let's take a step in and let's see if I will dive in and I ended up diving in (laughs) great so but then like it was kind of messy looking afterwards so I used a gray marker and went back in and I shaded in the shadows and then it looked a lot better yeah that makes a big difference was this the exact same technique you used for the students in the classroom because it's got a similar look although you do add more black shapes in this one Hmm. I don't think it was the same thing. I did try not to lift my pen that much, but I I did lift it a bit in the end. It's fine. Okay, we have Iana Andrade, and we've also got somebody here from Mexico. That's so cool. Welcome. So (laughs) Iana wants to apply to French art school, which is actually perfect because Uh Kat has experience with French art schools. They really look up to contemporary art. Do you know any contemporary artists or artworks that you would recommend to me as an inspiration? Okay, there is so much out there. And I find the problem for a lot of students is they just don't know where to look because there's a million magazines and websites. And honestly, a lot of the contemporary art on the internet is not that good. A lot of it is what I call internet art. It's like that Mm -hmm. thing where people are like, I saved 5,000 pieces of toast for 18 years and I line them up in order of great. Like it's a lot of like collecting and then arranging that like internet-y art stuff. Or it's like, I made this photorealistic picture out of scarves. And and to me, that's not really bona fide contemporary art. So there are two resources I can direct you guys to. So the first one is if you go to our art school portfolios page. If you go to artprof.org tutorials and you click on art school portfolios, we actually have a page that lists all types of artists from contemporary art and history. And it's just names. And we've linked a lot of the names and we've organized them by category. So if you go there and you say, I want to look at children's book illustrators, we just have a list just to get you started. So you guys can go there. But another thing that's really excellent, and I will put this into the chat box, there's a wonderful series that PBS runs that's called Art 21. And Art 21 is really excellent because it's all video documentaries, but it's of the leading contemporary artists today. People who are really doing very exciting, innovative work, not everybody on that site is going to be your cup of tea. There's plenty of documentaries I've seen on there where I'm like, eh. But I've also seen some that are <laughs> amazing. Um, I think that if you go to those places, you will find some that are really outstanding. And Ayana, if you want to ask me what particular area, like if you want to know a sculptor or a painter, I can type that in the chat if you want to do that. But the other thing, too, is if you guys watch our live critiques, we talk a lot about contemporary artists. So we'll critique a piece, but then we'll say, oh, this reminds me of Sarah Z's sculptures. Go look at her work. And so if you watch our critiques, that's actually a great way to get 
a constant stream of new artists that you're not aware of. So that's another right. thing that you can definitely do. Okay, so I think another helpful piece of advice is if you're applying for a very specific school, try to find students from that school. Usually they'll post their work online and then you'll see kind of like what sort of thing people are making and what sort of taste that school has or that those students have. And that's been incredibly helpful when researching schools and also knowing what to do when applying to those schools. Yeah, and Kat, you actually did reach out to a lot of those students and did they blow you off or anything or did you get responses? Oh my gosh. (laughs) <laughs> so luckily to the schools I applied to there was this one student who was extremely helpful she was so nice I almost felt bad because she she gave me so much information and oh my gosh wait this is a tiny story so I was in France by myself I had no friends and she happened to be coming back to France and she's like hey I'm having a birthday party. You can come if you want. And there are going to be a lot of students from that school that you wanted to apply to there. And I was like, you don't even know me. And I was also like, is this safe to go? But I went <laughs> I went, and I ended up talking to a lot of students from that school. And it was great. But also at the same time, I just didn't, I was just at a loss of what I needed and what to do. Because again, I was alone. And uh, I think I just... I was just asking the same questions over and over again because I didn't know what I was looking for and nobody could really provide that answer. And also I was like sort of a whiny 17 year old and they were all like 25 and graduated, right? They're much cooler than 17 year olds. (laughs) Yeah, so I'm sorry to the party goers there if I disrupted your party, but it was very helpful. Just reach out. Like the worst that will happen is you won't get a response. And the best that will happen is you get a lot of help. So just do that no skin off your back and we're here guys i mean we're streaming almost every day now so pop into the (laughs) chat say hello i get emails i got messages on instagram we're so happy to help you because you know one of the reasons i started art prof is because i know what it's like to be an artist and be passionate and feel completely alone in the world and it really (laughs) was alone because there was no internet when i was a kid and i (laughs) wanted to make the platform that i wish i had had when i was 16. And so that's one of the primary reasons why Art Prof exists. Okay, so Kat, tell us about this piece. I think it's an image of people on the subway. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is a digital piece that I made in Photoshop back then. It was like CS6, I think, Photoshop CS6. And I made it for a competition, actually. It was like the competition for technology or whatever, whatever, whatever. And I actually would encourage people to apply to competitions because, first of all, they give you some sort of prompt. And once you have some direction to go in, it might be a little bit easier for you to make an image or sculpture or film or whatever it is. And second of all, it might be a little bit outside of your, say, AP portfolio or whatever work you were doing in the first place. It might be a little outside of your range. And then therefore, it might make for a great addition to your portfolio to sort of diversify it. So this was a piece I submitted to a competition. I think I got second, but... I mean, it's kind of cliche now that I look at it. It's just like, oh, technology is bad. Everyone's looking at their phones. Bad. Free Wi-Fi. Bad. (laughs) Well, I mean, the theme Um, is not new, but I will say composition wise, this piece sort of kicks ass because (laughs) what I see a lot in art school portfolios is people can draw really well and they got great skill, but they don't know how to compose. They know how to make a scene. And this piece Mm -hmm. has linear perspective in it. You've got the scale change of the people. I really happen to like the hand in the lower left-hand corner because I feel like that's really close to me, but then there's these little people in the background. And so you may feel looking at it that it's very cliche, but I would just say visually, this is somebody who's really thinking about placement. And that's something which I think a lot of students really just don't even consider, not because they don't, they can't do it, but just because nobody's told them that it's something they should think about. So I love that. Okay, so we've got this other digital piece, the one with the plants taking over the kitchen. Uh, Tell us the story (laughs) behind this piece. This piece has got a story, right? Oh my gosh, yes, it does. This is actually one of my earlier pieces. I first, my parents bought an expensive tablet for me for my like, what was it, 14th birthday or something like that. And I was like, I can't let the gift go to waste. (laughs) I got to give them a reason why they spent that money to buy this tablet. So the first thing I did was create this piece. And it's actually kind of funny. This is such a huge jump and improvement from my past pieces. And back then I had a DeviantArt because all middle school people had DeviantArt or high school people. And once I posted it, 
a lot of the posts, a lot of the comments underneath were like, this is such a huge jump from your other pieces. Is this yours? <laughs> oh my god, people didn't was, believe you? Um, no, I think it was like just jokingly. I think they knew that I was able to do it. It's just like so different from the rest of my pieces. Because I don't know, before I was just doing fan art of anime I liked or something like that. <laughs> um, and then I did this kitchen piece all of a sudden. And I think one reason why it was such a jump in improvement for me was it was a subject I didn't normally draw. It was like the interior of a kitchen. The focus is not too much on the person. It's more about the environment that surrounds the person. And other than that, I was just very people centric. I was very focused on creating a good person. Um, and I learned a lot about light and shadow in this piece as well. It also really forced me to look up good reference photos. Like actually, I think this was the first piece I did where I actually took reference photos for those shadows and also like did a deep research like dive into the internet looking for good kitchens and kitchenware to draw as well and speaking of kitchens and reference photos how convenient for you guys that cat <laughs> did a digital illustration tutorial of my kitchen and so what's so cool about this tutorial is that not only do you get to see cat's techniques with photoshop but she talks about coming up with the idea, shooting reference photos. And you can watch us actually shooting the photos and setting up the scene and then manipulating those images and turning them into an illustration. Because I think a lot of people don't realize that you could take your own reference photos. Like if you guys want to draw an apple, please don't Google apple. Like go <laughs> to the grocery store and buy an apple. It's not that difficult. So for this mm -hmm. illustration that you guys can see, we were looking at pictures of butterflies and chrysalises, and you did the linear perspective based in my kitchen. This is such a good tutorial because you get to see how Kat really sources multiple images, it, bleh, images <laughs> to create an illustration. And another thing is Kat has a live stream, if you guys look for it, that's about how to do reference photos. So if you watch this tutorial and that one, that should give you guys a lot of different ideas to go on. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, we're gonna show you guys many more images from Kat's portfolio, but I want you guys to know about this event coming up that we are super psyched about. It is our Portfolio Critique Marathon. We, as an Art Prof staff, are gonna be streaming live for eight hours. We're gonna start at eight <laughs> o'clock at night and we're gonna end at 4 a.m which is a little scary for somebody old like me because I don't remember the last time I was up that late and I'm a little worried about it, but who knows? We'll just see what happens. But the idea is that if you guys make a one-time donation of $4 and you submit your portfolio by next Monday, January 13th, you can get a portfolio critique, okay? Now, the thing is you can, in theory, purchase a portfolio critique from us anytime you want, okay? And you don't have to be applying to art school. You can just apply, I'm um, not apply, you can just purchase one. But the thing is, I can tell you we don't charge $4 normally. So if you guys <laughs> wanna get in on this, submit to this portfolio critique marathon, go to the front page of artprof.org, you'll find all that information there. Okay, Kat, let's take a look at, I guess this is a sketchbook spread of this male and female figure with the red and the blue stripes. Where did you get the inspiration for this image? That's also a portrait of my high school teachers. I, I was in <laughs> um, <laughs> I was in this class called American Studies, which we sort shorted shortened it to Amstead, and it was a male female teacher duo that taught this class and it's actually kind of funny i was drawing it in class and i could hear the people behind me snickering because they like knew <laughs> that these were the teachers because it looks like them. i love the necklace that the woman's wearing it's so specific <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean of course yes she was wearing those she was wearing that so of course i drew it um i think also something that was exciting about this and also the math teacher drawing i did before was that they were moving targets and I was able to draw their essence. And that was really exciting because I didn't think I could do that with a still photograph. With these teachers teaching and moving. And they're there. Like, they will not disappear from your sight because they're teaching you. <laughs> um, and I managed to, like, draw, I don't know, their, like, essence. And I was quite proud of myself after these spreads. Well, so if you guys go to the cat drawing tutorial, one concept that we talk about is that you can make a drawing that is physically accurate. 
that looks exactly like that person actually looks, but sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like the person. So that's the thing mm -hmm. about this image is that these faces are not photorealistic looking. In fact, they're pretty distorted, but they really capture personality. And I could probably yeah. do a photorealistic graphite drawing of one of these teachers that would probably have less personality than when you were drawing them when they were moving. So I would just mm -hmm. encourage you guys, accuracy is not what you're after when you're drawing. If you want accuracy, take a photo. It's way faster, you get incredible <laughs> resolution because of how good the technology is today. And so just set that aside because, oh man, that lady on the left, it's something about that <laughs> hair and the am stud and it, it's just, real life is so wonderful and so engaging. It's just a mm -hmm. lot of students say to me, well, there's nothing to draw. I'm like, look around you. <laughs> it's a million <laughs> things to draw. How can you not have anything to draw? It's just that people think that there's nothing to draw because they haven't taken the time to realize how special certain things can be. Like when I went yeah. to China um, a few years ago and I was sketching, I would draw things like a dirty little pipe on the street. <laughs> And a lot of people thought I was crazy because it would be right next to a big tourist attraction. And they'd be like, why aren't you drawing the gigantic Buddha? And I'm like, because everybody else is drawing the gigantic Buddha. And I can just buy a postcard of the gigantic Buddha right over there. <laughs> but no one's going to have a postcard of that dirty little pipe. And I love that pipe. It has so much personality. So <laughs> accuracy is not everything. Okay, so we took a look at your gesture drawings already. Let's mm -hmm. go through and look at the sketchbook spread, which has the character designs. And I know character design is a big part of your practice now, Kat. So I'm really interested mm -hmm. to hear how this got started for you. I think these are just like little sketchbook doodles I try not to think too hard about. Um, I think the page on the right was like a I don't know, like a nice discovery, a nice treasure to discover. Because I started out with a little thumb guy on the top left. I call him thumb guy because he's like, he's like a little thumb. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is that how you started the character? Yeah, I was like, I want to draw thumb characters. I'm going to do it. And it happened to be on the top left. And then I was like, I'm going to keep drawing thumb people. And so I drew all these thumb people of all, I don't know, like walks of life, <laughs> of different personalities, et cetera, et cetera. And it turned out to be a wonderful spread. Like I did not plan for this at all. I actually didn't even have a pencil sketch underneath, which was really scary. <laughs> um, it just like went straight in with pen. And it just, I don't know, like once you draw enough, these magical moments will happen. Like I'm showing this really nice page now, but what I'm not showing is like the 50 other pages that I didn't draw well um and yeah i mean just like keep drawing and you'll discover things <laughs> well you know something this goes back to what Ten Thousand crows had been saying earlier about how they worry about how people are going to judge them on instagram but i, yeah. I think what really bothers me about instagram is that people don't post their bad work they only post the good right. stuff and that yeah. really is a huge disservice to younger artists because it makes them think, oh yeah, everything that I make just pops out amazing. And it does not <laughs> ever. No, so I think not. we're here to tell you guys that if you want to make good drawings, you got to make a lot of bad ones. That's just part of the process. There isn't anybody who hasn't had to do that who's an artist. By the way, going Actually, back to this idea of the, the thumb people, which I love by the way, <laughs> is um, if you guys go to artprof.org, we do have this creature design tutorial that Kat is in as well with Julie Van Bassett. And I think Julie said one of her ways to start character design is to just pick an object and trace the silhouette and then turn it into a design. And that's such a yeah. great prompt, I think. Like I was looking at this thing, like wouldn't this be a great character? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look at the silhouette, it's so funny. So that's a great way to start with your character designs, just because I know a lot of students, they say things to me like, oh, I don't know where to start. I don't have an idea. I don't know. And sometimes just little simple prompts like that are great. And actually Kat leads this character design tutorial on our website as well. And this one is actually half traditional, half Photoshop. So the line work is done with India ink and the colors are all done in Photoshop. Kat, can you talk about 
blending traditional and digital media because you're so good at both. And I think a lot of people are doing all digital and they don't have traditional skills or vice versa. And people get very stressed out about it. Mm. Um, I think it's really important to try both mediums and see what works best for each. I find my line work in digital media gets very stiff. Um, like I don't have the natural width and like thinness of line I would like when I'm using a nib. But another thing is that when I do digital, it goes a lot faster, which is why I end up doing my colors in digital media usually. Because I don't know, because I just like did a traditional line drawing that took forever. I don't want to take forever to color it in watercolor or something so I just put it into photoshop so honestly convenience <laughs> but also I'm trying not to sacrifice the quality of it either so well and if you guys watch this tutorial which I recommend Kat doesn't just show you how to make the character design she and Julie actually go through this whole brainstorming process for the character and they talk about different options and clothing and accessories because I don't know about you Kat but I feel like what I see a lot of my students who are into character design do is they design characters just on, hey, I think that looks cool. And they don't really <laughs> think about who that character is or what their story is. Because one thing I learned from you when we did this tutorial is you told me that you start with a story. You don't start right. with the image. And that taught me so much. Can you talk about how to start in that way? I think it's honestly just finding that hook that makes you interested in diving deeper. So, I mean, in the case of my thumb people, I was just like, Haha, thumb man, that'd be so funny. <laughs> so I ended up drawing a whole page of thumb people. Um, in my other stories, I'm like, oh, I really want a character that just jumps into a swimming pool at the end of the story. And so I just designed a whole story and a whole character for that story. So just finding one little thing that interests you, like maybe it could be, oh, I want to draw someone whose, I don't know, like teeth are huge. <laughs> I want to draw someone whose teeth don't fit in their mouth. Then go ahead and try that out. Anything that works, anything that gets you interested into learning more and developing a whole personality, a whole character is going to help you. We have a comment from LSC in the chat. I'm really struggling with concepts for my pieces. I feel pressure to have to stand out, but often lose motivation instead. So Kat, you actually did a stream a little ways back about how to come up with ideas. And right. I think that it's a really common struggle for a lot of artists mm -hmm. is, well, how am I going to figure out exactly what I want to do? And mm -hmm. I think you just have to be on the look for things. Right. So for example, right. I had the student last semester who was so funny because he would just bring in these scraps of paper and tree bark, like just anything that was just <laughs> off the street. He would just come in and I would say to him, like, where did you get this? This is so beautiful. I love the texture. I got it on the street. Like, where'd you get this? Oh yeah, it was sitting on the street when I was, I was like, are you, are you just like around the school just hunting for stuff? He's like, yep, that's exactly what I do. <laughs> I think that's the coolest thing. I mean, I have another yeah. friend her way of hunting for ideas, she goes to antique stores because she does oh, a lot of found object right. sculpture. So she's just mm. walking around looking at objects. And you don't have mm. to go to an antique store for that. You could be walking to school and say, you know what, on my way to school, I'm going to pick up three objects and I'm going to mm. take those three objects and I'm going to turn them into a character. It can be something right. really simple like that. I think one thing else to add about concept and I guess motivation to act on those concepts is you need a lot of willpower to finish your ideas as well because it's not just enough to feel love for the idea. You also need to have the time and the effort to complete the piece in the end. When I'm making comics that are many pages long, I'm not feeling inspired all those pages. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Absolutely not. I am inspired by maybe one moment out of 10 pages or something. But I have to draw the 10 pages to show that one moment. So it's really having the idea and then pushing that idea to finish. That's the most important. Well, I don't think people realize how much discipline it takes and just how many manual mm -hmm. labor hours you need to practice right. to get good at this. Like, Kat... You yeah. took piano for many, many years, and you're like an amazing <laughs> pianist. I mean, Thanks. think about all those hours you logged practicing piano. And I feel like I get a lot of young artists who show up, 
they've been doing it for like a month and say, how come I'm not ready to do the Olympics? I'm like, because you just got started. <laughs> yeah. That's why. Right. And I have students who say, well, I did a really bad drawing. I'm like, so do another one. Like, <laughs> move on. <laughs> it's not a big deal. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that's really, really important is just to say to yourself, not everything I do is going to be good. In fact, right. when I do work, I would say only about 20% of it ever gets like professionally presented. I mean, mm-hmm. I do sometimes post little crummy things on my Instagram story. And part of me is like, oh God, Claire, what are you doing? But I know for my <laughs> students, it's a good thing for them to see that, to say, look, Clara's a professional artist. She's a professor teaching at an art school and she does crummy sketches, okay? So I think if me as a professional If I have to make crummy drawings, I think you should make crummy drawings too. And honestly, I get my best work when I stop caring. I know that sounds really weird. I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, shouldn't you care and be passionate? Yes, you should. But not necessarily when you're actually drawing, because I think when I start thinking too much when I'm drawing, I can't draw. It's just like (laughs) paralyzing, right? And so what inevitably happens is I get mad that I'm doing that. And then I say, screw this, whatever. And then I just draw whatever. And I'm like, hey, that looks pretty good. So (laughs) just just stop caring, guys. And what I do when I work is I actually have like patterns set up. So I, I do something where I listen to something that I can focus on so that I don't think about my drawing too much. Kat, do you ever like obsess over the drawing and then you can't draw? so bad. And so I'll put on like a podcast. And so all of a sudden I'm thinking about, well, I was just thinking about Michael Fassbender just then. But anyway, there's no Michael Fassbender (laughs) podcast. But if there was, I would totally listen to it. But anyway, what I'm saying is if you have something else to distract you mildly, then you're Mm -hmm. not obsessing over, is it good? Is it bad? Do that later. Okay. You got your whole life to judge yourself, (laughs) but just draw, Mm -hmm. like have a good time actually doing that. (laughs) Okay, so Kat, let's take a look at these last um, oil paintings that you've got. Mm -hmm. And were these from posed models or did you use photos? What did you do for these? These are all posed models. As you can see, they're all looking off into the distance, looking a little dazed. It's because they're watching movies. (laughs) Were these friends? Who were these people? Oh, okay. So, yes, um, some of them are friends and some of them are actually students of my mother's because as you remember, she's an art teacher. Mm -hmm. And I know that they are all young women or young girls, but I actually did have a lot of portraits of like men and also older people as well. But I ended up being the most proud of the young women series, the young girls series, um, because I just, I just painted them the best. Maybe it's because I was a young woman when I painted them. I was like, I can relate to them. (laughs) So I painted them, but yeah, these are the ones that were the best. But I think one that really frustrated me was the blonde girl portrait. I just couldn't get her skin right. Like, I just couldn't do it. Um, It was really difficult. And yeah, that's not one I'm very proud of. But I think I submitted it regardless because it just showed like how many portraits I did and like the number of different people I sought out to paint. So I included that in my portfolio. I mean, I wonder if maybe one of the reasons you struggled with this painting was that so many of the colors are so saturated and intense that it sort of Mm -hmm. minimizes the impact of the skin of the figure yeah because that cadmium red and the alizarin crimson in the dress is like really a lot and i know (laughs) that i really struggle with red paint because red is such an annoying color it's like it's either like straight out of the tube or it's bubblegum pink or it's maroon (laughs) like there aren't a lot of variations i feel like green is like I'll be anything you want me to be, you know, like red is just uh, a <laughs> pain in the butt, which of course is why it's my favorite color. Let's see, in the chat, Karen Liu is saying, sometimes I feel like a painting I do looks good in my room, but looks crummy as a digital submission. I struggle about whether to use it to submit in a photo. I think that's extremely common, Karen. I don't really know any artist that loves the way their work looks when reproduced yeah. in a photo, especially things like oil paintings which honestly right. will never live up to the real deal. Right. And yeah. it's it's just a reality of the situation. You just have to accept it. But granted, there are things you can do to make the photos come up better. So again, mm-hmm. if you guys go to artprof.org, you go to the art school portfolio section, 
we do have a new updated section about how to photograph your artwork, how to photograph 3D artwork. And we have tricks in there that you don't need a lot of money to do. I try to give people lots of options. So if you honestly have nothing but a smartphone, you can still make it happen. Of course, there are different levels of that. It's great to have a DSLR camera, but I know not everybody can afford that. And that's okay. I mean, smartphones are mm. incredible now. Like, yeah. I didn't really think the cameras on the phones were ever going to be that good. And now I rarely use my DSLR. I only use it when I'm shooting like high end video for everything else. I just use my phone. So you guys mm. are lucky because in the olden days, we had to shoot slides. These things were horrible. And it cost like 50 cents a slide. And you didn't see if they were good until you had them developed. And so you could shoot like a roll of 36 slides and only three of them would be usable. It was horrible. Like, oh my God, it was so bad. So I think it's also like helpful to note to Karen that like once I saw the Raft of the Medusa. Do you guys know that painting? It's in the Louvre. I'm going to put it it's my in favorite the painting. chat box so people can see. Yeah, it. it's my favorite painting of all time. And it's enormous. It's way bigger than life. And after that, I've seen it in photos. It's literally, it's just not the same. It simply is not the same. Not only is the scale difference different, but I don't know. It's just like the energy of the brush strokes, the lighting, it all gets lost. So even... The genius painting, Raft of the Medusa, that cannot be translated that properly into a photograph, in my opinion. So don't feel too bad <laughs> if your drawing can't be photographed as you want it to be. It just, it probably won't be. Sorry to be a bummer. Yeah. I mean, Karen, I would just say, don't let that prevent you from submitting your work somewhere unless mm -hmm. it's the fault of the quality of the photo itself. Like if you just have a crummy photo with bad lighting and there's glare, you don't want to do that. But up to a certain point, there's only so much you can do about that. So don't worry about that at all. Okay, you guys, if you want to continue to grow as an artist, I would remind you guys to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell so you don't miss out on anything. We do also provide artist mentoring because I know a lot of you need the support with your portfolio, with your artistic practice. You can purchase a portfolio critique or a Skype session. And I want to say thank you to our top supporters on Patreon who make artprof.org possible. Our content is 100% free. We do not have a paywall. And it's because of people like our Patreon supporters that actually make that happen. And just so you guys know, I hope that you will explore all of the other resources. We have tutorials. We have art school portfolio critiques. We also have been doing Skype calls with a lot of high school students lately. So I hope you guys will check that out. Thank you so much for showing up for this stream. We will see you next time.